For the last three years, Luigi Venditelli has been working with famed whistleblower Bob Lazar on the most anticipated project within the UFO community. Bob's story spans three and a half decades of controversy, conspiracy, and revelation. From his explosive claims about secret government facilities and reverse-engineered alien technology, to the countless debates and investigations that have followed him, his story has shaped the modern UFO landscape. And now, amidst congressional hearings and whispers of secret UAP crash retrieval programs, Bob's story is more relevant than ever. Enter Project Gravitor. Luigi and his team have meticulously recreated the legendary S-4 facility based entirely on Bob's memory, from the craft itself to the offices and the labs where it all happened. Using cutting-edge software and the latest technology, they've built a virtual replica, bringing the mystery to life like never before. But this project isn't just about the place. It's about the man behind the story. Over the last few years, Luigi has spent time with Bob, getting to know who he really is. The person behind the headlines, behind the controversy. What drives him, and what truths still remain untold. Project Gravitor will reveal insights into Bob Lazar's world like you've never seen before, and could potentially, once again, change the course of history. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Debrief Today. I am joined by my good friend Luigi Venditelli. What's up, Luigi? Hey, what's going on, man? Me and Luigi, we got we did a lot of catching up before the pod, but we're finally yeah, ready to sit down and talk Project Gravitor. Yes. Highly anticipated. Oh, yeah. Big time. Is that pressure ever? It's it's the pressure never goes away you know so it's been like well i think for anybody's followed us it's almost yeah. been three years yeah, that's right so i don't think we announced it at the very beginning but it's been like two years i think people know about it uh like a few people knew about it two years ago it's been about a year and a half that people really know some people are getting antsy about it there's the, there's because project gravitor is like a three-part project that's right so it's the documentary film it's the uh the VR experience, and then there's a book. Yes, should be a four-part experience, a project, because eventually we're going to be making the die-cast model of the flying saucer, the, the sport model, right? Have um, during during this process, have you encountered any type of resistance at all from any entity at all, or like a government entity, or nothing like that ever? You never get a weird phone call, hear a click on the phone, or... We, we've tried to keep this as quiet as possible uh, to, to the point where Bob was like, guys, you got to talk about it more, you yeah. know? And we were like, yeah, we're about to. You know, we, we knew that there was going to be a moment where we would kind of go, we're doing this. Mm -hmm. And that's when the DeLorean trailer came out. And we were kind of worried about that because we thought, what if people don't perceive this right? You know, like this is some type of sci-fi movie. Luckily, people were super supportive on it. Yeah. It was really well received. Yeah. So we're like, okay, we can kind of have our own thing yeah. too, where it's not it's not just a Bob thing, it's also a Motivo thing where we're creating the, the story of Bob Lazar. Yeah. But at the same time, the idea was to bring some lightheartedness into this very serious project. And I guess we were taking the project so seriously that the DeLorean came across to us as a way to kind of like make it fun. Because it was, as much as it's fun to work on this, everybody's very focused and very, it's a very serious process. We respect the data like diligently, very military style process to get everything accurate so we wanted to do something fun so that was that was a worry for us what was making us happy was bob liked it uh there's really no way i can prove it without revealing my identity and getting myself into more trouble than i have already exactly what's going on up there well there's several uh actually nine uh flying saucers flying discs uh that are out there of extraterrestrial origin and uh they're basically being dismantled. Uh, some are, well, in various stages of, of completion, built from other parts, and they're being test flown and uh, uh, basically just analyzed. I was 29 years old 
working on the most incredible project in the history of the world. No one has ever been able to show exactly what I saw with my own eyes until now. Let's travel back in time to December of 1988 when this all started. The next thing is going to be an official trailer that we're working on, which is not a DeLorean trailer, but it's an actual S4 yeah. trailer. It's the movie. It's the movie. Yeah. 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 The movie should be ready yeah. in two months. So, woo. Yeah. And this podcast is only coming out in a few weeks, so Ex minus that. Yeah. Dang. Yeah. This so, is exciting. Yeah. Now, what happens is that it'll be done. Now, what we don't know exactly when they're going to actually air it for, for everyone that's where it's right. going to be available. There's also uh, a great other documentary that's going to be uh, preceding ours, and it's from James Fox called The that, Program. The Program, yeah. Right. So we want to give him all that space that's you know, right. to get his thing out there, and then ours will obviously uh, come right after that. Highly yeah. anticipated. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't know about Project Gravitor, Luigi, uh, for the past you know, three years has been working very closely with Bob Lazar, a famous whistleblower, you know, came out in like, what, 88, 89 uh, yeah. with uh, George Knapp and told the whole world that he worked at this secret facility at Area, F Area 51, reverse engineering actual UFO craft that the military had retrieved from various places. Uh, the most compelling story, in my opinion, in the 20th century. Oh, yeah. It is probably, to date, one of the greatest stories of mankind. Yes, it is. Great importance. One of the greatest uh, revelations. That's right. Because it says something pretty big about what's going on behind the scenes. This is something that we even discussed a little bit in an interview with George Knapp. Disclosure, right, is something that we're all hearing about these days. I mean, since 2017, the Tic Tac thing came out and that changed the, the, the whole playing field. But things are even hotter now than they were before. The people who don't know anything about flying saucers, their immediate perception of the topic is not necessarily a craft in a hangar guarded by the military in an installation that is within a compound that is protected by the national security of the United States. In their mind, this is maybe there's potential life out there. The fact that this topic is becoming more mainstream is great, but what I thought was important with Project Gravitor was the fact that there is a reverse engineering program probably still today. And this is not reverse engineering Russians or Chinese technology or anything. This is reverse engineering non-human intelligent technology. First of all, if you guys want to check out uh, anything, you can go to, I left the links below to the Instagram, but also the website if you guys want to stay yeah. up to speed. Yeah, check and, that out. And yeah. you guys are also now posting on YouTube. Yeah, that's right. So you'll have like weekly updates on YouTube. Yeah, about that's right. All the ongoing. All the ongoing stuff behind the scenes, how we how we made this thing, yeah. the VFX behind it, the interviews we have, the exclusives we mm. got. There's going to be some pretty crazy revelations in the film. So we're going to be giving away a big... Revelation plus showing hard evidence that Ooh. has never been showed be shown before. You're hearing this for the first time, yeah. folks. Oh, yeah. This is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, to hype you guys up even a little bit further, check out this exclusive little teaser to Project Gravitor S4, the Bob Lazar story. Is that what it's called? That's the new name. That's so the for the about for about a year now, we mm -hmm. we we advertised. Uh, Lazar, the original whistleblower, That's as the right. name of the film, and that was going to be the name we're going to run with, uh, but we changed it, and it's called S4, the Bob Lazar story, and I think it, I think it's better. 
you know, because it's, it. it's really about S4. So we figure we go, you know, this is this whole thing we did was we built S4. Like we basically recreated it. So yeah, that's the best name to give this film is calling it what it's really all about. You guys heard it here first. Check out this clip from S4, The Bob Lazar Story. We'll be right back. Some people just have natural abilities, and that was my natural ability was just dismantling things to find out how things worked. I think I had either a engineering or scientific quirk to me as a kid. Well, you know, most of the kids would be out playing baseball and things like that. I'd be down in the basement taking apart my mother's favorite clock or something like that. So. I think it's something that just I had in me for a long time and that uh, interest in science, technology and engineering grew as time went on. The first time I went to S4, uh, the bus arrived at the facility and we got off. I was with Dennis who basically led me outside and took me around the side of the small cutout in the hill and it was, there was no one around. It was just deserted. And we came to a, a small door, which was like I would find out later on, the hangar doors were camouflage just to match the general area. Above the door was a, a camera and a housing, a little white housing focused down at us. The door was unlocked and Dennis just led me inside. While I was at S4, I was brought into a briefing room and sat down and instructed to review a pile of documents. The project I worked on, Project Galileo, um, the information in the briefing was accurate. Everything that it mentioned in there matched what I discovered working with the materials hands-on. So there we have it. That's exciting. Yeah. Getting oh, yeah. getting that out there. I mean, you've probably, you know, shouldered an immense amount of weight because in as far as UAP, as far as any of um, what concerns the UAP phenomenon, this particular story, also you know, told by uh, Jeremy Corbell, had yep. a different you know a different uh, yep. documentary on it as well. But this particular story is if not the most, but one of the most fascinating stories oh, for sure. in the history of the UAP subject. Oh, for sure. So did you? F are you feeling that pressure to deliver? Yeah, I've always felt it. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so the, the first thing was about, the, the first pressure was to be, to make sure that everything we did was going to be exactly what Bob Lazar so like basically the recreation of it, the accuracy, the details had to be exactly what Bob Lazar said. Mm -hmm. So we didn't divert. We didn't, we didn't take, uh, other than the only creative liberties we would have taken in this is very mundane things. He says, this is a great opportunity to kind of put closure to all the little details. Yeah. And there's a difference between, I think, sitting down, um, you know, uh, through an interview, trying to recall things. Right. And then spending two years going through the details meticulously. And not only that, but it was it was interesting when we started, it was just the craft. So that was a big job in itself. That, yeah. that took like six months, yeah. just the craft, right? And from the craft, then we went into the hangar, the equipment, the, the, the benches, the tables. The, the tools, then we went into the hallway, then we're like, okay, what about that? So break room. Uh, that was something that was a challenge because Bob, I would always, you know, be like, okay, where were the fire extinguishers? And it'd be like, fuck, I don't know. Yeah. He goes, I know there were some, but I don't I don't remember exactly where they mm -hmm. were. Yeah. But a lot of stuff he did remember. Like there was no computers in there. Like we wanted to put little computers from the 80s. Right. You know, it, it make he's like, no. We had built them, put them in the in the in the scene, 
And he's like, no, 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 get that out of there. There was no computers in there. Yeah. There was no computers in the lab, no computers in the hangars, there was nothing. As we were progressing and building it, we would Zoom call him, share screen and go, look, we, we followed your, he would send us emails with like all the listing equipment. He would go online and try to find us some pictures. With, right. He was great. Yeah. Once we built it, he would go into it and he'd be like, oh, wait a second. No, that, my mistake. He goes, it was much smaller than that. Because when you're saying something from memory, yeah. you kind of be like, oh, maybe it was like 30 feet, you know, yeah. and then, and then you, you don't it see out. it. Yeah. And then when you actually measure it out, you go, okay, no, that's again, not 30 that's feet. That's just another testament of you were, if you were somebody trying to cover up a lie, you would just go with whatever go you just with said what initially. You just said. Yeah, that's you, right. You would never go back and that's try right. to correct yourself. Yeah. So stuff like that, Bob just didn't remember all the details, so we took creative liberties there. But as far as accuracy of the facility, the coordinates of the actual real coordinates of the facility, the environment out there, the craft, obviously, the most important, the propulsion lab, the equipment in there, the reactor, the element 115, the briefing room, the briefing documents, the nurse station, the, the hand scanner, the hand scanner, the Adenomat 2000 hand scanner. The, uh, the personnel? Oh, the personnel, yeah. Barry Castillo, Dennis Mariani, Rene, the security guards that were there. There was other scientists wow. as well. And then you can actually talk. Like, the guards will be NPCs and the nurse will be NPC. Dude, um, what? Yeah, so... There, check that out. Let's say I go here. We just want to do a little quick shoot of this guy. Really get in detail. What was Bob's reaction to all of this? He's freaking out. At the very beginning, he was hesitant to share yeah. Yeah. too much information. Yeah. And as true. the project went on, he kind of got confident with us mm. and remembered more. Remembered more, yeah. It's so, like you're navigating his memories. I mean, if, if we ask each other questions about, like, hey, Chris, remember 25 years ago yeah. when you were at work? Do you right. remember what the color of the table was? If you'll remember that you were there. But if I actually give you a picture of that place where you used to work, yeah. you'll go like, oh yeah, and right next to there, there was, because you'll remember by visually seeing it. This kept happening with Bob. We actually went in and filmed That's the mocap right. here. That's, right. <laughs> That's you, yeah. That was me doing all the movements. And... Yeah, yeah. So uh, this one's like, this one's just called Touching Craft. So it's just an example of uh, like somebody walking up. See, and you can kind of, Look around, put your camera at different angles, see what while looks cool. Happening. Like while, yeah, while the animation is happening. Uh, the bus, the bus route, the Janet Jet, Groom Lake, the Groom facility. <sighs> yeah, the EG and G uh, special projects building. Wow. The uh, you know oh, resume going too. out to a bunch of different labs when he was applying for a job and he sent his resume to the Lawrence Livermore uh, lab where um, Ed Teller was working. Right. And, you know, so a lot of this stuff is covered in the film and you'll get to see that. You could fully interact with everything. You'll be able to turn on lights, turn off lights. If you want to go into uh, uh, the briefing room, you just open the door and walk in and actually read inside the briefing documents, wow. take the papers, you could hold them up. The coolest thing I think is going into the propulsion lab, which is very nearby the briefing room. Again, everything's interactable. So all the equipment there, the, the, the X-ray scanner, the oscilloscope, the welding machine, the scale, everything works. Inside the propulsion lab, you'll have the reactor that was inside the craft. It'll be unassembled on the bench. You could physically pick up element 115. You could put it on the scale and it'll measure 223 grams. Put it all together, rotate the emitter, you can create gravity. It will not allow you in the game to go closer to the hemisphere unless mm -hmm. you re-rotate the emitter. You'll be able to pick it up, the whole reactor. You could walk it out, you could walk into the hangar with the reactor in your hand. You could walk up the steps, put the thing down, because you, you have to crawl into the craft. So you have to get on all fours and then slowly bring this thing, bring the waveguide down, put it on, start up the craft and fly away. Our, our desert floor is real because we went to the desert. The our desert, desert mountains are real because we went to the desert. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that we physically did. So and it wasn't just online, yeah. right? Yeah. 
that is, I think for, you know, most people who follow this is probably a, a giant relief. Yeah. You know, the last thing I think anyone wanted was like fluff or do you know what I mean? I think people are just give us the facts, man. What, what went down? What happened? How does Bob remember it? Like, and it's nice because Bob is never in, in my opinion and in the interviews that he's shared, it doesn't seem like someone who ever not only doesn't exaggerate, but he also never speculates. We actually really wanted to make sure that in this piece, all the all the things that were related to the to the main meat of the story, which is what happened at S4, let's just, let's let's all agree that the reason why there's so much interest regarding the Bob Lazar story is because he worked at a facility that had extraterrestrial technology yes. and and it's it's spacecrafts. Okay, so that's a big that's a big deal. That's yeah. that's a really big deal, and. When we look at stuff that's been done in the past, there's been a lot of things that have been done, whether they be commercial uh, product, product projects or things we see online. A lot of this story has been covered in the past. Mm. So George Knapp did incredible work in the past. There was also Bob and his friend Gene that had created the uh, Bob Lazar and Government Bible tape back in 1990, right. I believe. Uh, Jeremy Corbell did a great movie back in 2018, I believe, and covered a lot of topics. So let me ask you this. How does one make an original film about Bob Lazar knowing that there's so much history out there that's available? It all started because I wanted to recreate the craft. Okay, so the whole right. project, Project Gravitor, started because I wanted to recreate the sport model mm -hmm. in a professional die cast, like a collector edition flying saucer, and which doesn't exist. Does that have to do with the uh, the old model that used to exist? Yeah, they, we got one here. One, that's right. That that was done in 1994 from the Testers Corporation with a guy called John Andrews that was running Testers. It was, it was a, a plastic model made in the USA. We said, we got to make that, but we got to make it out of die cast and we got to make it better. Right. Bob was really interested in that because he says it would be great to see it in metal. Yeah. And... We needed to create the schematics, like the measurements and yeah. all that stuff. And even though that was accurate, there's the interior. I needed well. Bob. Yeah, yeah, I needed Bob. So, out of all the stories out there, who worked on a flying saucer that we know about that we could potentially get information on? Well, that's Bob Lazar. Yeah. And if so, we started. I started going online and going, okay, if we're gonna do this, let's get the data. And the data was all wrong. Like not wrong. It was very inaccurate or not not cohesive online not consistent, like, not yeah. consistent so i was like okay well we got to get the right information and by doing that by doing this process it made me realize i think it's a it's something that should be done right i think if we if we consider the story of bob lazar it's 35 years today uh it's in december it'll be 35 years he's he's getting he's getting older and this information will eventually well, it's already history. Yeah. It's just going to become more important history yeah. as we keep going into this field. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty certain of oh, that. Absolutely. We'll be coming back to this for decades to come. Oh, yeah. And so I think it's it's I think it's important to to do something that really demonstrates or really elaborates the details of what he actually saw and not what people understood it to be. So you said the word elaborate. So that's, I think, one of the main focuses here oh, with yeah. this project is to like, okay, you said this. Oh, we really went deep. Let's go deep. Oh, yeah. Was it hard to uh, get that out of Bob? Because it seems like in a lot of interviews, I don't know if it's like a recollection thing or just like maybe just details or something he's not interested in. I, I don't know. But like, <laughs> it, was that hard to like extract? I, I got to say, he was extremely amazing to work with mm. okay so when when i first approached him it was about a model so he was obviously a little bit worried about who who am i yeah you know who's this guy you know reaching out and i i think he went checked me out checked my background saw that i i had a history in making stuff and so he got that from me and kind of felt a confident that I really knew mm. how to go about doing this. Yeah. All I needed was to sit down with the man himself and get the information. So I was a little nervous because I was like, is he going to give me the information? Am I going to get, you know, and it was a lot 
easier than I thought. Mm -hmm. We sat down the first very very first time uh, we sat down together. I had brought with me in my luggage like these big pa like blank sheets of paper, color markers and rulers and all color uh, color palette examples, material textures, and because I'm like, if it's if, you know how what what did it feel like? What did it you know? Was it rough? Was it smooth? Was it so we spent uh, two full days sitting down just recreating the craft on paper, mm. which was a huge endeavor because this thing here, yeah, the the sport model, the design of the craft is pretty simplistic. Yeah, it's not like there's a lot of there's no bolts, there's no rivets, there's no there's nothing like that. But the way it's made, it's obviously not made by us so the way it was designed was a very i had to carefully measure things because if i was going to replicate it in metal i had to make sure that it would look as close to the real thing right. as possible you can't in a human oh. yeah with human technology in miniaturized models so that was the that was the, the beginning and and he was great to work with he was very forthcoming in fact we we went through so many details that we went through physical details. I mean, Bob would stand up and I would say, how how narrow is the entrance to the craft, you know? So we, he didn't know how to do that at the beginning. I remember he was like, because he didn't have a measuring tape when he was there. Mm -hmm. And something that a lot of people should know is that when he was working there, nothing was... Uh, permitted except for whatever he was told to do so it's not like you're you're told right. you could go into the craft you you don't just go grab a tape measure in a in a pen and a in a paper and you, you can't really? do any of that it's yeah. like you are just go in there do exactly what you were told don't talk talk only to your partner and whisper do not get do not look elsewhere do not communicate with anybody else Ooh, so it, it's heavy it's a very stressful slightly toxic environment so it's not like he had a lot of leisure time to measure things so everything was very uh based on his proportion of his body so if i said how narrow is the entrance well he's like okay well he would get up and he would just be like hold on and i remember the 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 patio door he opens up the patio door stands in the middle closes the patio door and uses the patio door as the measuring, and he goes, "Okay, smart. That's about it." And he moves out, and he goes, "Measure that. That's pretty much, you know, how much space I had." And that's like great, you know, because so smart. That's a perfect way of like <laughs> measuring, right? So that was a. That's how we started. Uh, started doing that, measuring the, the little seats. He said the little seat because three little seats in that, and what he says, what they perceived as seats he says they were never confirmed the seats but he pretty much thinks they were and they were very tiny com compared to them to fisher price little seats for for children for toddlers yeah. which is not something that he was expecting to see yeah in a in a craft right you know obviously you know we would have adults yeah in what there. does the adult craft look like right <laughs> <laughs> exactly i remember when he sat with me when we finished he said this is probably the most details I've ever gone through on the craft. I I never even went this deep with John Andrews when I did the, when he when he helped John Andrews with the Testers Corporation. Wow! So he says we you really asked a lot of questions. And I I had a lot of questions, <clears throat> and I wanted to get it right. I said it's it's like we gotta have. I don't think that the community in general I, this no there's nothing. You know we see these pictures. Of the craft everywhere, uh, yeah. And do you, as someone who's worked meticulously, and and you know maybe this question is also directed to Bob indirectly, but do you guys ever see those and kind of cringe and be like, oh, they've got this wrong? Uh, I I I would I gotta say I do. Yeah. Uh, Bob doesn't really comment much. Yeah. He'll just say it's wrong. He's not on the internet either. He's yeah. Not. If ever I show him something, yeah. I remember. On the second trip, I went out there. I had created a book. We had a 374-page book on the craft. Yeah, wow. Which we created. It was an internal document for the craft, and he was impressed with that. And uh, there was other pictures that I had of people online that had the craft mm. designed or whatever. So I would say, you know, people 
show this and he, he would just go that that's wrong that that's incorrect uh sometimes he would uh, look at things yeah. and say it's okay you know but it needs to be a little bit fatter you know yeah. it's too sleek or it's or some people made it too thick yeah you know and so that also was a huge uh challenge the the that's a bring bringing the a point to height yeah when he did the model with the testers corporation it ended up being uh that the height of the craft including its uh little antenna mm -hmm. on the top because there's a little right, antenna yeah. on the top of the craft which is the waveguide terminator uh was 16 and a half feet now it's it was really what was really interesting and you've been to our office mm -hmm. Our entire office is the exact size of the craft. Whoa. It wasn't even like we, we I had measured. Really? Yeah. It's literally the size of the craft. Whoa. So when I took a measuring tape and I went 52 feet with diameter, which is exactly the size of our office, it's 52 feet by, well, one portion of it is 52 by 52. That's big. And then, and then we have our other side, but one of the main areas is 52 feet. I said, shit, we have the size of the yeah. craft right here, right? And then our ceilings are 40, uh, 40, 12 feet, sorry. They're 12 feet high. Mm. So I thought, hmm, I need an extra four, feet. four and a half feet to, to achieve the height of the craft. So, But what that did is we started actually physically manipulating equipment in the office imagining the lower floor level to, because we could we were like on the floor right with bob there yeah, and yeah so we really went through a lot of detail in terms of like does that even make sense and if it was that height where is the edge of the craft mm -hmm. so we by knowing what was on the lower level where the um, emitters these cylindrical emitters are these big cylinders what would be the height of the bottom level where the disc the bottom disc uh portion the plate yeah would where does it reach, meet the top where does it meet, and... so where's the edge of the craft and we determined that it was at around a six foot height from the ground yeah. and then from that point we were able to determine the little stairs that were in the hangar so there was a there was a lot of things that were making sense yeah as we built it in a 3d model and also for real you yes. never actually really built it but we used scale yep. to, to to do that and a lot of things that bob had said to us prior to us building it in the 3d environment or having something physical could not have been verified until we had done that mm -hmm. and when we did that they were verified so you know the the, the angle of the ceiling inside the craft when you crawl into this because you have to crawl into the craft how many steps how many crawl steps until you can actually start standing right? right so he had measured he says well you know maybe like four or five until you could start he was actually get, crawling in your yeah, office actually at one point? Craw yeah wow. we have him crawling on the green what screen actually it was really <laughs> funny because we have well it'll be in our film where you actually see bob crawling into the craft oh cool you know what i mean so we had him on a green screen so that'll be a super cool shot so we have uh meta bob which we digitally de-aged. Yeah. And then we have live action Bob, which we built the green screen set. I'll show you guys that yep. later. And then we have modern day Bob. So like there's this <laughs> dynamic, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So you'll have young Bob who's acting out the things. Right. And then wow. older Bob who's explaining it on a green screen. Wow. So it's kind of him going back in time. I guess that's our our, yeah. our cell. That's, the whole that's why DeLorean. we got the DeLorean. That's why we got the DeLorean. Bringing you back in time. Oh, there you go. Right. If you yeah, want a so one-liner cool. yeah. for the yeah. movie. <laughs> I'll show you guys some green screen stuff. Yeah. We kind of filmed even something as simple as, hey, Bob, let's go down the hallway yeah. and kind of look into the side door, do right. little fun Just scenes like that. Yeah. So we actually, right behind you is where we set up the entire green screen. Put some tracking markers, some tennis balls to yeah. track everything. Uh, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this camera movement and copy it onto an Unreal camera. Right. And then he's in the hangar. What it is, is you can take an actor, let's say walking in the middle of the desert, right? Watch I can take it does. and just completely replace him Watch. without any green screen or anything. Yeah, yeah we did show him what we did Watch. in the office here. I'll let, you, I'll let that settle in for a bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh! Kind of complicated. Yeah. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. He regrets all of this. <laughs> totally. I tried to like, yeah. hey, where it replaces him in the no scene. No way. 
<laughs> no green screen, nothing. What the hell, dude? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Because he'll explain. He's actually, it's real live action film of him explaining. I'm crawling into the craft, as you could see, because wow. it'll it'll have the 3D craft in the environment, so it looks like he's in the craft. So we really we really did a lot of work on precision, and he was impressed with that part. And I think that led us to be to take the project of just the craft. Yeah. And really evolve the project yeah, and say full documentary. the full documentary of S4. So that's how that happened. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen the work that you guys have been putting in, you and Chris, uh, Chris Matto. Yeah. Uh, and Romain. And Romain. The team. Yeah. yeah. And your whole team. Um, you guys have been working tirelessly on this uh, project. And every time I go there, I see these incredible updates, you guys. I'm, you know, not going to spoil too much, but there are some really really banana things that you guys oh, yeah. have recreated in you know using this the most high-tech software um one thing that really stood out to me uh and this is you know we're going beyond the movie a little bit but you also let me put the vr goggles on yeah because i can film this so if you let me walk around <laughs> you can film the screen physically actually filming as if you had a camera in the environment yeah, so if you look right now, the camera's at an 18 mil on the top left. Yeah, I yeah. Think it's just like a real camera. Right? So you can change the, oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who needs cameras? Right. That's crazy. It's way better than photo mode in games. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, here, look, wow. Oh, there's the reactor. Once you record that piece, it's not set in stone. You can't walk with it, but just okay. rotate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Everything's to scale. God. That's the door? Yeah. That's the entrance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I know now. When you Lay start it that way, yeah, that's the end that's the angle. Wow. And this is just like that's I a video. That's a 360, that's a 360 video. video. Yeah. Eventually, you'll be able to walk around in an open space, and and everything will be interactive. Interactive. Yeah. That is wow. That's, that's breathtaking. This is what Bob saw. That's what Bob that's saw. The demo that we showed Bob. Oh my God. There's something. There's something terrifying about this, isn't there? <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Right? I'll tell you right now, like for for myself experiencing this when I when I just did the small test you guys had me do, uh, it felt it part of me felt like I wasn't allowed to be there, and it right? was such a weird and I'll, I'll use the term ominous because that's what it felt like. It didn't feel like it was evil. It didn't feel like it was wrong, but it felt like there was something greater than myself that I was witnessing, and you know I can I can only imagine what it would be like to see the actual craft, but I can I can imagine that feeling being amplified uh, quite a bit. Um, so that's that's how I know you guys are doing something really interesting because I, I got that feeling. There is a very ominous feeling when oh, you're yeah. doing this. This isn't, and, and I never, like I kind of understood it when, when Bob was talking about it, how like there's this like, dr the sense of dread almost, like yeah. this ominous. It's and true. And when you see that in a militarized facility and you realize how how earth shatteringly paradigm shifting hmm. this this object you're looking at is for humanity as a whole that weighs heavy on you when you stare at it and you feel that instantly hmm. is that something that bob felt while you guys were recreating did he have any of those feelings come back yeah it's it's really interesting you ask that because th there was an evolution in the 3d space and the evolution was different from the cinematics to the VR experience. So the environment is the same, uh, but the quality of the environment is much higher in cinematics. So when you have a cinema, if whatever you'll see in the film yes. is incredible. I mean, mm. the quality of the of the shots are going to be. I hope people like them, but they're very realistic. Well, they look real. And uh, we had to. It, it took a while to evolve the 
VR experience to give that realism. That that was a, a, a different technique, a different process. And so it evolved. And so at the very, very beginning, when we showed Bob Lazar, we actually had this video. We were in Las Vegas with him, and we were also meeting up with Gene Huff. And we put the goggles on him for the first time, and he and he, we got his reaction. And he was just... he he couldn't believe it and he goes it's like you downloaded this from my brain that's what he said that's that's so ridiculously real <laughs> i mean it's like you downloaded that from my brain that's how accurate he said he goes he goes you guys did it like he goes it's exactly like that's what it was work, right and that was v what we considered to be our version two. And when it, we were super happy about that. I mean, that's uh, the ultimate compliment. Oh uh, yeah. That was, we felt a, a sigh of relief because oh, we're like, my God, thank God, you know, cause we had a lot of work to, to do that. And we were like, oh, let's just really hope he, he, he thinks this is, this is accurate. He was like, he couldn't stop looking around and he was like, this is incredible. This is exactly what it looked like. I, that was it. That was last year in Las Vegas, and then earlier this year, I went back to see him and his wife in Oregon, and I brought the VR goggles, and we had a V three. We had a version three in 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 the new goggles, mm -hmm. and I'll never forget this. There was there was a friend of theirs at the house, and Joy was upstairs, and. I remember the friend puts these on and she's like, Oh my God, you know, this is, this is crazy. This is amazing. This is, and she takes them off and I have, we have different scenes in there. So I wanted to change the scene from the standard hangar scene where the door is closed and it's what mainly Bob experienced when he was there. But sometimes they would open when, when not sometimes when they would open the main hangar door mm, to take, take it out there's light that comes in obviously right there's there's daylight it's it's there the times that he was there that they did that it was it was still daylight so there was a scene that we created with daylight and i'll i'll never forget that and we i, I should have recorded it my team freaking is pissed off that i didn't record this <laughs> but i wasn't expected so i say here bob check this out this is with the the hangar door open so he goes okay and he puts it on and usually bob is kind of like immediately going to comment and be like, wow, this is, this is, and he's just so quiet and he's just looking around. And I got worried because I'm like, oh no, we, we, we messed something up. Like there's, he's not saying, he's not telling me anything and he's just looking around and I'll never forget this. He takes them off. Now their friend was there. She saw this and he just gives me the goggles and he just clenches up a little bit. And he goes, give me a minute. And he walks away. And I thought, is everything okay? And he looks at me, he goes, I didn't think I could get those feelings again. He goes, I remember that. That really, and, and that, what, and that scene with the door open, there's a shadow that, it, there's a hard shadow created by the craft because the sun beams into the hangar. And it, it's almost even more ominous with the door open at that time of the day. So I could totally understand. It real. Yeah, it really gives you this like creepy feeling. Got, yeah. So you can actually, oh. when you put on the headset when our VR yeah. game comes out, you'll be able to have a button, open the hangar door, walk outside. We're gonna have a free mode yeah. where you can kind of do, do whatever you want. Yeah. 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 Sandbox mode? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, just this shot right here of the light leaking through. Isn't that great? It's, it's something that like, if you let yourself imagine what it would be like to work in that hangar. Yeah. You know, with the lighting the way it is and the, all this stuff, yeah. because what we built is like, we can actually change, yeah, like change the lighting yeah. in real time. So you can be like, oh, what did it look like at midnight? Oh, well, that ray tracing. That's cool. So when we actually do our cinematics, right? Um, what we do is we use something called path tracing, which is like yeah. a higher yeah. a visual quality. So you would get something like this, and just to load one single frame, frame a photo, it takes this long. Wow. Yeah. So there's a lot of steps that yeah, go into it. Because 
as much as it's really cool to see a flying saucer, it is a different feeling when you're actually standing next to it. You're gonna people yeah. will see this with our with our uh, VR experience. You put the goggles on and you're you're in the hangar. Yeah, it, it's a different vibe. There's something else that happens. Yeah, it's a different vibe, and and you know, there's there's one thing about seeing you know a flying saucer at night. And yeah. there is a totally different vibe to seeing a craft during the day. In the day, you know, you look at all the uh, you know the famous pictures of crafts during during the day. Yeah, uh, those were always more impressive to me. And so there's something about that that makes it real. That's like, oh, this is inter this is interacting with my world now. Yeah, you know, this yeah. isn't some like dark fantasy. This is interacting with you know, me taking a walk and going to the store. Mm -hmm. Like, that's how real that is. And there's something about that that, yeah, like you said, like is, is ominous in itself because it's like, it it, it's it shows you how close we are Yeah, to this, to this, to this extraterrestrial existence. Yeah. And, you know, yet how strong mm -hmm. the, you know, government or these, these secret, you know, projects resolve is to keep it from us. Absolutely. Um, there, there's, there, there's, you know, they're equally as strong. Absolutely. And the one thing standing between both of these things happening, our objective reality and their, you know, uh, uh like safe, like security is Bob and yeah. his story. Yeah. And, and it's just really fascinating that he is sort of, and you by extension have become this gate, this gatekeeping of, you know, an ultimate shift in how we view the phenomenon. Like that is just so massive for me. View it and experience it. Mm. And that's why we call it uh, the VR. It'll be called S for the experience. Oh, I love that. You know, because it's, it's like we've heard uh, for the people who've never heard about reverse engineering programs. This is all new, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, it's it's very interesting. We're hearing this in congressional hearings. There's one that's coming Wild. up soon, actually. Uh, but for those of us who have heard about reverse engineering programs, if not since the since Bob came out, or even within the last five to six years, yeah, it's 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 something to hear about it, but it's something else to be standing in the middle of it. And there's. I have to say, you know, there's a lot of people out there who are iffy about the story. Uh, I spent three, almost three years with Bob. There's not one time that I felt him ever being dishonest, not even my team. There's not one person on my team who ever walked away thinking maybe this guy is not telling us the truth. That's That says a lot to me because yeah. it's an entire team. We're not like two people. Uh, there's quite a lot of people interacted. That story is possibly the most important story that ever came out about what was actually going on behind the scenes with at least the American government. Yeah. We don't know about other True. governments. It clearly indicated that the United States government or a portion of it was in possession of of artifacts and crafts that were not made by humans. Mm -hmm. They that they had them hidden away from everybody, including congressional oversight. Presidents. Presidents, yep. uh, vice presidents, generals. There's there's military leaders who had no idea about this. We we the people who've been doing the research know very well that this is not something that has been disclosed uh or talked about openly even behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you we have an opportunity now to have the experience of it. We we've heard the story a lot, we've heard the concept a lot, but it like anything when you actually walk through a place, it's different. I just recently with my whole team, we there's a 3D experience that that is happening in the old port of Montreal and it's I think the great I think it's called Cheops, the Great Pyramid of Giza. You could go in and actually walk around the Great Pyramid of Giza. So we went, we all did that. We all put our goggles on, we all walked through this. It's freaking amazing. And I don't want to diss it. Ours 
is more realistic. Yeah. Okay. I but, mean. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's it's like ours is really like another level well, of realism. I, yeah. I don't understand. Like I'm someone who you know I don't do any type of After Effects or any of that stuff. Your team is legitimately filled with geniuses. Yeah. Like you Amazing literally guys. have like yeah, like state of the art tech with people who know how to manipulate it like no one else. Yeah. They they do their own. Oh. They have fun we, with it. We've. I got people on the team that wrote the programs, yeah. modified the programs, created tools in the programs. Yeah. It's not like it's not like we just took the software and used it, you know, yeah. as as anybody would. It, there's there's been a lot of engineering going on with the actual softwares. Mm -hmm. That really made us work hard in making oh, this. No doubt in my mind how hard you guys are working. And one thing that I think you guys. Uh, you know, you guys are promoting, but I think not promoting enough. No AI was used at all. So uh, yeah, you're you're creating jobs, and you're building all of this to oh, yeah. spec from memory to spec from the ground up. Oh, absolutely. So these things aren't uh, oh, let's use this new AI and like make this landscape or no. Every thing was a brushstroke. Every single piece of our project is made by our team by people yeah by people we have the reactor oh yeah we you, have, wait you uh, we like have, the, yeah we have you remade it yeah yeah we have the reactor here's the, oh. here's the reactor this is real size and this is exactly what it looked like yeah and, yeah. It, and it's signed by bob if you look underneath it's yeah. got bob's signature on it okay you know, you know? so yeah so, so this is the real if you're in one of these alien crafts. That's what you're gonna see. You're gonna see exactly this. Exactly. So this here, th for those of you wondering, this here is exactly what alien tech would look like. Exactly. Not an exaggeration, not uh, some type of Hollywood mock-up. This is exactly. from a first-hand witness, exactly what you would find on an alien craft. And he goes, he goes, I got goosebumps. It almost feels like it's gonna work, oh, you know? Man. So you, you take off the hemisphere. This here, is what it looks like underneath too? Yeah, that's so this crazy. is like that, right? So basically that's like a replica of element 115, mm -hmm. okay? There is this little drift tube that goes on the inside and it the element 115, there's these two little grooves that it kind of sits in like that. And then you put the cap on like that and as soon as, he says, as soon as you put the hemisphere on it, he goes, it won't work until, like if, if, if you keep it like that, it won't work. He says, as soon as you do that, he goes, as long as the emitter, which is up there, by the way, you see that big cylinder oh, on yeah. the top with the pipe sticking out? That thing, yeah. That's a, the emitter. Uh, That's what the emitters look like that are on the, on, yeah. the, on the bottom yeah, level. There was three of those, right? There was three of those. Yeah. And he goes, in the lab, the emitter was sitting on a table to the left of the reactor, and there was an amplifier on the ground. And he says, as soon as Barry would rotate the emitter, that turned on. And he says- And they weren't connected. No, he says it just worked. And he goes, and that's when you couldn't get and he goes, it. And he goes, and if you just, look, he goes, the stronger you would push, the harder it would push you back. So it kind of went with the strength. It wasn't like strong all the time. So this, the more force you would put, the more force. Like an it, actual force field. Yeah. So it, he goes, that was incredible because he goes, nothing does that. There's also a possibility, you know, he goes, I've been contemplating on this for 35 years. So he says, yeah, it's very likely that it's simply like some type of uh, gravitational field or some, other force that we're not aware of. This sits on the floor of the center of the craft. Mm -hmm. So there's there's a seat here, there's a seat there, all pointed that direction. So there's one, two, three seats. And there's a center area where there's an actual indentation in the floor that's square. Yeah. That's where this sits. It doesn't lock into place, it just sits there. And from the ceiling, there's a three, diam three inch diameter pipe that is a pipe that you could pull down from the ceiling and it applies perfectly on top of the uh, reactor. Okay. And what's really cool is that he said when we would pull this thing up or pull it down, he says the material, he says it wasn't a telescopic 
thing. He goes, it was just disappearing and re like he goes, it didn't make any sense. He goes, because we couldn't see where it was going. Wow. The pipe that was on the emitters, yeah. which is on the bottom level, he says those would swing 360 and there would be no bend. There's no joints, there's no that, weird. He goes, it looked like it just became like some that. Some meta material, some weird. Right, so that was an, that was an interesting yeah. feature. I said, I'm not gonna be able to do that with the model. <laughs> I just said, unfortunately, he goes, I, I get that, you know. Yeah, but, your mind will have to be telescopic. <clears throat> yeah. And the pipe that goes like that, you know, I said, was it, was it something that you could push out of, you know, like, could you try to break it off? He goes, that thing was so solid. He says, you could not, like, bend on even, it. Even with the leverage of how he it couldn't, really. He goes, it just stayed wow. the way it was. So how? This, there was no seams. There was, everything was seamless. Everything, yeah. And, and this was at a time before 3D printing existed. Exactly. Uh, so it was almost like they 3D printed. I think so. It, in a way, I think you know, so. yeah. uh, maybe not as we do it, but. I um, think that's the process. Did, did yeah. he also mention like one of the walls was transparent? Yeah, we're working on that. You're, uh, yeah. <laughs> AI is not going to be able to do that. AI, eventually one day AI will be able to do something like that. Yeah. I, I'm sure it will. It's not there yet. No. You'll be able to smell it though. Yeah. You can, yeah. You can smell it when it doesn't have a soul. I feel it would be a lot easier if you implied a lot of AI in there. But you oh. guys chose, willingly chose the hard route. Oh, absolutely. And it, it's interesting that you say this because... For the last, I think for the, you know, people are trying to get us to give us, give them more updates. And believe me, it's coming. It's really That's coming. That's why we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, we're, we're so close to the, to completing this, but for a few months we were working exclusively on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now this is a big deal. This is something that is, I don't, I don't think. I can express how much of a big deal that was, but to actually have the most accurate terrain that is out there by Papoose Lake, where this base was located, mm -hmm. the elevations, the type of sand, the type of clumpy sand, the vegetation, the Joshua trees that are out there, the mountainside, the rocks, the realism that had to get then created, the the border shore of the dry lake the actual dry lake bed itself all that in order for the shots to actually give you that vibe that we're out there it took months mm -hmm. of hard work to literally recreate that and when you see them, when you see, I mean, I'm I'm so blown away from my team. Like I, I literally like. Oh, dude, you, they're you gods send me, to me you send me photos sometimes. Yeah. I'm in the middle of something. Yeah, and, and I'm yeah, like, right? how dare you <laughs> send me this right now? Because I, I have to I, drop everything. I, ha same thing happens to me. <laughs> They'll be like, check this out. We just got this render, and I'm like, holy shit, is that a picture? Yeah, you know, and they're like, no, that's 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 the landscape. Texture, reflections. Like, wow. uh, you so know. the 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 thing was, if we got to do something. If we're going to make this project happen, yeah. if we're going to make this environment, where is it in the world that we cannot go to? Yeah. Right? Yeah. So even places that are really out of reach, like Antarctica, you could still go to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Okay? Like you could still figure it out, get enough money, get a few people, get the equipment, and go out to Antarctica. You cannot go to Papoose Lake. Right. You yeah. cannot go there. No, you can't. Period. You can't not only go there, you yeah. can't even take a picture of it. Exactly. It exists only, only uh, on satellite. Yeah, exactly. Right. That meant a lot to us because we said, we got to bring people there. Mm -hmm. If we're going to do this, we got to do this absolutely right. Yeah. And we also had to get Bob's approval as we were building the details of that landscape. So it's like, hey, Bob. What do you remember out there? Well, he was like, there's much out there. Yeah. He goes, it, 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 and don't forget, Bob was there in 88 and 89. So we have satellite data that we actually got from the late 1980s to all the way to 2024. And there's a lot of sh shift and difference in that terrain right. over the last three and a half decades. Interesting. There's a lot of uh, foliage that grew there that was not there back in in the late 80s bob was very clear about the fact that yeah there was there was but it wasn't it wasn't like extreme foliage yeah 
versus what you will see on satellite data today. So there's clearly a change. Obviously, mm-hmm. there's three and a half decades. It's, yeah. It, things grow. That's just right? so interesting that you guys would like, like anybody else wouldn't have cared. Like I feel like, I feel like I almost wouldn't have cared if I watched it, but maybe I would have sensed it. You would have sensed it. And that's yeah. exactly the point is we don't want to give people just an entertainment piece. We want to provide a historical piece. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of a difference. It's like if we're going to entertain you, but it's such an important topic and an important story, there's a history component to it that has to be accurate. You, you want me to repeat that? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so I'll say it in like a fun way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, please. We'll, we'll add some music and stuff. Here. So the most illegal thing I feel like we did, other than building a whole military facility, you know, was creating the outside of S4. And the reason for that is we averaged out the height map data. And what that means is we created the outside of S4 and we used satellite data to create the little hills and mountains. So we pulled it from uh, government websites and we pulled some American ones from the early 2000s, some American ones from the 80s and some Russian ones from the 80s. And that was hard to find. That was, (laughs) I will say there was uh, weird loopholes to get to the Russian ones. What we did is we averaged that out and we created all the little mountains so you could have the most accurate uh, outside of Papoose Lake, of Area 51, of Groom Lake. Like, yeah. We really tried to take Was that there whole any area. discrepancies between yeah, the satellite yeah. images from the year 2000s to the 80s? Was there any differences there that you noticed that were like, oh, why is this not consistent? Or Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the data in hot spots yep. were flat. Were flat. Yeah. 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 Back in the 80s, the hot spots were not flat. Yeah. They had bumps and stuff, indentations, yeah. and yeah. you actually got a feel for what the landscape. Yeah. Now, why do you think they would do that if this wasn't real? Exactly. That's a weird thing to do. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's like when I pull it up into a, my 3D modeling software, yeah. and I just see it's completely flat. I go, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not flat. I mean, no. that's an like we can see yeah. that from a plane. Yeah. Right. So, if you want to sense a scale on what we did for the satellite data. Yeah, there so you have all these like, uh, here, put it back in the mode. It's a little foggy. So all these like bumps yeah. are era accurate to the bumps you would get if you pulled yeah. satellite data from the 80s. Huh. And that's, that's allegedly where everything yeah. happened. That's, that's right. Yeah. On that's the right. side mountain yeah. here. Yeah. In the side of the mountain. Yeah. Those are the hangers? Those are the hangers. For the nine hangers? Nine hangers. Well, I tell you, as you know, as someone who's been following the story for a long time, to me, this is music to my ears. Now, I know that out in in the nether of the internet, there are people who have their own opinions about Bob, yeah, and about his story, and uh, there are some controversies here and there. Uh, I trust your judgment as a friend, yeah. Um, you know, I've always been Thank biased you. because I want to I want to believe this, uh, but I do trust your judgment. I, I know you're a good judge of character, and. You know, for you to say that you've spent three years with him and there wasn't once where you, yeah. you know, thought he was, you know, throwing something over your head here. Um, Not once. That, you know, for me really instills a lot of confidence. And then to hear the amount of care and love and to see the amount of care and love that you guys have put into this really, again, conveys to me the confidence that you have in Bob and the story. Oh, yeah. Because I think any any uh, deviation from that would present itself in the project. And all I've seen so far is full steam ahead. And you guys are, are literally doing something that w- might end up, you know, changing the course of history. I believe this is... I... I, I, I... Thank you, and I hope that this does it does the story justice. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things that I was going to add to what you were saying is that there's there's it, this is just this is a team effort, right? So it's not just me. Obviously, there's a whole team behind it, and the fact that I never felt anything bad from Bob, yeah. or any BS, if you want to no call flags. it, no red flags. That also applies to the team. And I think what happened was as time progressed and they really started feeling, because a lot of them came in, some of them came in completely not believing the story, but they didn't even know about the story. Didn't care. It was a job. For them, it was a job. They're like, who's Bob? Some people didn't even know Bob Lazar was. Sure. Right? So they're like, who's this guy? And so, you know, you start telling the story and they're like, really? 
are you kidding me? Like a yeah. flying saucers. It, it really was the beginning of, of how they perceived it. And as time progressed and they met Bob, worked with Bob, they're also looking at, you know, listening to him, trying to be like, is this for real? You know, and they've told me, they said, you know, nothing. I don't, we're not getting any vibe that this mm -hmm. guy's telling a lie. And so I think that motivated them yeah. because they finally like, well, well, dude, this is like a big deal. Like this is, if this shit happened, then we got to make this look even better. So I, how many times have I left the office? Cause I don't just work on the project. I got to take care of the company. Right. So I go home and I, I do boring stuff on my computer when I'm home, but I'll Ask them, hey, guys, what's going on? They're like, oh, we're still at the office, and it'll be 9 p.m. Yeah. And I'm like, wow. I will never say thank you enough to the team because they come in on weekends. I know. Some of them work until midnight, and they're they're back at work early in the morning the next day, like super prep, like ready to go. Yeah. They're like, oh, yesterday we got up to here. We checked this out. You know, like we, we got to finish this and we'll get. It's so cool to That's see so that. Beautiful. You know what I mean? Like everybody just wants to get it better and better. The, even the fact that like your team has gone through an arc. Yeah. I think is a story in itself that, you know, maybe one day will be explored in a documentary. Because uh, yeah, it's, it's so cool yeah. to, to hear that because. You know, a lot of your team as well, like especially like Chris and Ramey, I think are, are very left brained. Yeah. Uh, they're, you know, they're logical thinkers, incredibly intelligent. Extremely. Um, yeah. Probably a lot in common with Bob. Yeah. You know, on that front. Yeah. Where they're like, true. Just give me the facts. I don't really care about the fluff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, to even talk to like Chris and, and you know, see how he sort of progressed on, oh, yeah. you know, where that is, is really incredible to see. Um, you know, because not everybody gets to have this type of experience either. You yeah. Know, if, if we could take every skeptic out there and walk them through what you guys have been through, you know, with this story and all the all the evidence and all the things that are going, you guys oh, yeah. are going to shed light on. Oh yeah. You know, maybe we would have a, a far fewer skeptics in the world. And and so, how has that sentiment changed for them? I think what I remember from talking to some of them was at the beginning, everybody was like excited because they knew he's a very well known person. He's on person, Jerome, you know, like he's. Yeah. But when you get into the, you know, reverse engineering a craft yeah, from another crash, star craft. system, yeah, exactly. You know, they're like, okay, you know, there's a lot to, to, to digest, right? How has your point of view changed after meeting Bob? How 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 have has it changed and how much has it changed and what was that like? Man. It was like you don't know the guy until you meet him in person. Did your opinion on the whole subject change? Yeah, I mean look as, as someone who is filming and editing a lot of it I'm also looking for loopholes, right? I'm still looking. Yeah, I'm looking for a story to tell and it's if it's completely one-sided Then it's not really a, it's not yeah. really like a, a documentary or a story. Yeah. So even in editing the way he says stuff the way he's like I have interviews of the same topic over maybe a three month period. And it's just, it's the same story locked down, you know, like word per word, especially when like we're interviewing Bob and we're talking about the technical stuff, like the propulsion systems and yeah. how it actually worked. That's when I'm like, okay, wait, yeah, wait a awesome. minute. Yeah. yeah. Other yeah. than, other than Bob, you might be like the closest person to working on an alien craft. Technically, yeah. I yeah. guess. Yeah, that's, that's right. true. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I I think this. I think there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be able to be shown in our film or in this project that will, besides the revelations and some of the evidence that we have, which is incredible, by the way, uh, the fact that there's going to be some physicality to the story. Yes. In a although it's 3D, it's feels like it's physicality it's that's what 3d is today and there's real physics in 3d environments right so that will help a lot of people who are on the they're 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 kind of on the edge where like they're not sure is this real is this not real and there's some things that will be really clarified yeah and i think that I personally believe there's going to be some things that are going to just push people to go, yeah, this, there's just no way he could have known that. And mm -hmm. and I think you and I even spoke about this one time was 
about the lighting inside the craft. I don't know if you remember we had this conversation. I do remember. I remember, you know, um, because when you're when you're showing me these things, first of all, like I'm like, this is insane. Okay, (laughs) because everything you're showing me is insane. And when you're in the craft at one point. Um, there is, well, you can tell the story of how that came to be. Maybe right. we'll go there. I remember we built the craft and I remember calling Bob and saying, I'm looking at, I'm looking at the interior of the craft. How did you guys see in there? And Bob goes, well, there was, there were, there was two tripods in there. He had forgotten to mention that cause he didn't think, you know, we were only talking about the layout of the craft. And I said, Jesus, that's super, super important. What kind of light? So we went through the whole thing. He goes, you're right. You're absolutely, he was even like, you're absolutely right. I have to give you what kind of equipment was in there because you're, you're right. We got the craft, but now how did we see anything in there? Cause it's, it, there's no lights, right? There's no lights that turn on. So we, we positioned these two industrial, these yellow four spot, halogen spotlights that were available back in 88 and 89 inside the craft they were they were tel- you know these telescopic stems that were brought down because it's actually pretty low in there so how, they had how high about five 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 and a half five feet ten wow you know maximum at, at the highest height, point. height maybe a little less than that wow so it's and that's at the highest point yeah. as soon as you start walking it tapers down it tapers down so you immediately have to start crouching down it it you eventually have to get on your hands and knees because you you can't stand in the craft. Even when you're in a 3D environment, you'll you'll see that you you actually have to start crouching down. So wait, these beings also had to like crouch down and crawl. They're much smaller, but still, there there's I don't think because you'll actually notice the uh, you'll you'll actually notice this carefully. The access from the the craft the, in, the entrance of the craft. When you walk into the oh, crawl into the craft, but if these guys were walking into the craft, uh, in my opinion, I don't know exactly how tall they were because we don't have a real size of these things, but it would almost make sense that they would maybe just do this only at the beginning. Mm. But as soon as they're like two steps in, three and a half feet, they're like-ish. they're clear. The honeycomb hatchway, and, and there's a there's a little hatchway that's in the um, in the back side like on if you walk into the craft th- the seats are pointed to the right and so to the left there's a honeycomb hatchway mm-hmm. its position on the floor is perfectly positioned at a at a place where the um the inclination of the ceiling would not require the being to be crouched down mm. so i think the position was intended for their height to yeah. be standing there. Interesting. Okay. So that's also very interesting. Okay. So this light. So yeah, going back to the light. So we Sorry. we basically put these two uh, exactly where Bob said they were. There's these extension cords that were running in the craft, which I also thought was really interesting. That's what I thought was wild. Yeah. When I saw that because I remember, I, I I remember going. It's it's true. I mean, there would be extension. And Bob was like, yeah, the the extension cords were running behind, and I'm like, the extension cords. He's like, yeah, for the lights. Suddenly, even to us, we were like, holy shit, we were working on this. Humans were working on this. Yeah, now that you have now you our have technology mixed with theirs. Mixed with theirs, it suddenly had a different look to us. And we're like, and there was extension cords, because obviously the tripod has to plug into something. So there's an extension cord that goes all the way out and falls to the ground and goes into the wall. And Bob's like, of course. He says, the guards used to always tell us to watch the, the, the wires on the ground. I said, really? He goes, yeah, that was something that they used to yell at us all the time. You know, things like that, if if you're making things up, it, like the way he was saying that, that was pretty interesting. So I was like, okay, yeah, that's true. There's extension cords. He says the extension cords were orange. He remembers that. He says the tripod lights, the fixtures were yellow, and they had four and they were angled uh, horizontally so that they would beam the light towards the ceiling of the craft. So one of them was near the third seat to the left, and one was behind the uh, center uh, amplifier uh, in the craft. You'll see that. Obviously, you'll see this. And both pointed upwards. He said to me, he says, even with those lights, it's extremely dark in there. 
And I said, really? Those are pretty bright lights. He goes, yeah, they're super bright, but it was really dark in there. Like swallow the light? And I thought, that's that's weird. I go, because it still would light up the place. I mean, it's not that big, you know? It's like two big tripod lights. That These are industrial lights. He goes, he looked at me, he goes, I don't know. It, 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 was, it was pretty dark in there. So I, I wrote that down, you know? I'm like, dark in the craft, even with these spotlights on. I thought... Really? You know, these are bright lights. So we built them. We we put the exact lumens. We, we researched the whole thing. Yeah. Right? So it's not like we just put light. Love you know, it. Research the whole thing, the, the, lumina, the, the lumens that are emitted from these halogen lights, pointed exactly where he said. And every time we would go in the craft, we were like, it's 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 really dark in there. <laughs> you know? And it's like, why? And I, I would tell the team, like, what's wrong with the lights and they're like they're at they're at max capacity but i can't see anything they're like i don't know they're like it, it it's really dark in there and i was like but that doesn't make sense so like but that's that's the physic the physicality yeah the physics in the environment are accurate it's accurate okay so there is nothing everything is properly turned on there's light bounce there's sheen there's a million things going on that is accurate to real life. So mm-hmm. if we have these at a hundred percent and there's it's still dark in there, yeah. How would he know that? So cool that he said that. Yeah. He's like, I don't know, it was just dark. It was just dark in there. <laughs> and so we had to like to make some of the renders come out, we actually had to blast the light at like six, seven times their intensity. Right, just so people can see what's going on? Just so that you can see what's going on. Wild. I remember remember looking at the stills. I think it was the stills you were showing me. And from outside the craft, you had this cable running out the door. Yeah. And then inside the craft, you had these these tripod lights. Yeah, yeah. And I remember feeling so weird about seeing that. There was something about the sort of intersection between this – craft that can you know fly through i don't know uh, land sea and air and space and whatever as fast as it you know Mm -hmm. whatever like this craft that can go anywhere technology that's maybe millions of years ahead of ours and then a stupid stupid extension cable (laughs) coming out the hatch (laughs) is there was something so insane about it i know like just seeing it i realized i was like oh this is insane this is our our puny little uh our our, you know we think we're advanced that's right and then we still gotta plug things in yeah you know what i mean like it's being plugged in and there's this clunky yeah that's right construction light in there yeah and then this sleek beautiful craft you know lamborghini of a you know of a sports model there was yeah there was something interesting about that that and um did you uh are, are you like the 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 flag is that something you want to you want to mention too? Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, the the just going back to the interior yeah. real fast. I'll, I'll talk about the flag. Is that was something that made the team all go like, shit, that makes so much sense. Like none of us had made that conscious. I mean, it's so. There should be light in there. It, it, it well, not only should there be light, but it's not. It, it's our equipment, yeah. and that's what we have. That's right, right? Like, if you're unless you have a flashlight, you would set up tripod li- industrial construction lights to light a, uh, you know, with and you need a wire that you got to go plug into a wall because otherwise you have a generator which is going to make such a racket in there. So, you, so it was so interesting to see that because <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah. That's true. That's that's what would be. Yeah, that it's the equivalent of like cavemen um, yeah. <laughs> starting a fire in the back of my Tesla to see what's going on. Like, yeah, it's, exactly. <laughs> you know, just be like, what? Well, yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> be like, well, we gotta we gotta see something in here. Might as well start a fire. Yeah, same. So and now, on the on just on the outer shell of the cr- like on the outside now. So you talk about the flag. There's obviously again the, this hatchway, the entrance to the crafts, qu- quite narrow. And right stairs, no. to the left of it, so there's in the hangar they had this like you know these stairs that you mobile can roll, warehouse, mobile, yeah exactly, sort of. bring up to the to the entrance there, and they had they 
Bob had said, they said the ones that they had there was actually flush to the floor. Yeah. So they probably had measured it or whatever. So they had a perfect, you know, you would get to the top and you just walk into the yeah. craft. And you step onto the craft. If you step there, your hands are essentially on the shell of the craft. Uh -huh. Okay. So your hands, are, you put your hands on both sides. Your body is now inside this opening. You'll see that obviously in the film and, and in the VR experience. But to the left, there's a... It's about seven inches by maybe three and a half inches or four inches, a reversed American flag sticker on the craft. Okay. And now this is something that Bob Lazar had talked about back when he came out with the story. He literally said, he goes, well, they, this craft was there and it had a small reversed American flag sticker. A lot of people, I remember, I, I remember you know, what the hell, you know, an American flag, reversed American flag. What the hell is yeah, that? that you know, Anti-American? Yeah, like, what, is what does that, that mean? You know, yeah. so even I, I remember going like, what does that mean? It's reversed. And it never occurred to me that, well, I'll explain it after, but it, it was, a, it was confusing. Mm -hmm. And he, he was the, one of the first things he had ever noticed when he first saw the craft was yeah. the flag. And he wasn't up on the stairs when that happened. He was on the ground walking into the hangar with Dennis Mariani. It, it made him think it was ours. He, he was convinced. That it wasn't like... He, he was 100%. He yeah. didn't have UFO in his head. He was like, oh, we're making these oh, now. He, he walks in, sees that, and it instantly goes like, oh, shit. These are one... Like, these. Yeah. that's what people are seeing, these flying saucers. Yeah. It's, it's our secret... Boy, test, are they going to... Boy, are they going to yeah, look on their yeah, face when they right? realize. And then he sees the, the American flag on it, yeah. and he's like, yeah, this, this is crazy. This is a top secret fighter, whatever. You know, like, he has no idea he's looking at something from another planet. and Potentially. Potentially. Or, or something that is not made. Yeah, <laughs> well said, yeah. He, he wouldn't even not agree with what I just said there. He'd be like, we don't know where it's from. And it's a reverse American flag. And now... From the angle he this I, I always say this because it's a super important point. From the angle he was standing, walking, he was following Dennis Mariani, his superior. He had a security guard behind him, and he's walking towards inside. He's walking into the hangar. The craft is to his left. He sees this, and ahead of them is the door to go into the hallway. He he slides his hand on the craft. He sees the American flag. <clears throat> Gets reprimanded for touching the flag, uh, the the craft. But there was a lot of people, I remember when I was doing the research, there were a lot of people complaining and, and criticizing the fact that there would have been no way for Bob Lazar to see the American flag from the angle he was at, blah, blah, blah. And that stuck with me. I remember that stuck mm. with me because I was like, I'm being so incredibly cautious with details that I'm, I actually had that, you know, in the back of my mind going, I wonder... Yeah, I can't if, wait to see. I can't wait to see. Oh, that's so cool. You know what I mean? I was like, I can't wait to get into the environment. I'm, I didn't tell anybody. I said, I want to get in there. I want to go stand exactly where he was. He was, And I want to see if I could see the flag. And I, I'll never forget it. I took the, the goggles on. Nobody in my team knew I was going to do this. That I was going to go. They, they thought I was going to analyze the ceilings of the hangar and whatever. I put the goggles on. The first thing I see was the flag. Wow. And I was on the ground and I'm like, and I remember going, you could see it. And they're like, what? Oh, wow. What, what, what are you talking about? You could see the flag. And they're like, yeah, so? And and I remember going, I, I know why I just said that. You know, because I, I had read so many people saying there's just no way. And there and, was... There was more of that too, right? There was uh, before we get into that. Let's let's uh, put a pin in that. Yeah. But let's talk about why the flag is reversed. Uh, that's important, and and that's something that obviously we researched, and it's 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 not it's not really a mystery. Mm -hmm. It's really not a mystery. But why it was applied on the craft exactly where it was? Well, that's a mystery. Well, we, we'll still consider that a mystery. But in standard protocol of using an American flag on a uniform, on a piece of clothing, or on a vehicle, the flag, anytime the flag, the American flag is on the right shoulder of a uniform or on the right shoulder of a t-shirt, 
or on the right side of a cap, or on the right side of a plane, a bus, a car, any vehicle, the rever it's, in, it's reversed. And the reason for that is because the flag is, the wind is pushing the flag backwards. So where the direction of the vehicle, right. if you look Would at the sense. left side of the craft, of, sorry, of a vehicle yeah. or of a uniform, it's the standard American flag. It's because the wind, as the vehicle or the person is walking forward, mm -hmm. the wind is pushing the person, the, the, the flag backwards. Yeah. So on your left side, it would look normal, but on your right side, it's reversed. It's completely So that might have been standard. the right side of the craft? And so we... As, to, so it's a round so craft? The, yeah. So, so the, the assumption, and also Bob kind of agreed to it, since... The entrance, you got everybody will see this. Since the entrance, the, the flag was right to the left of the entrance. When you look inside the craft, the seats are pointed to the right. Right. Indicating this is the right side of the craft. Right, right, exactly. You see what I mean? Yes, yeah, so that makes sense. So that checks it, out. it just checks out. It just makes sense that it's on the right side of the craft. So is that the reason why they put a, a reversed American flag? Maybe. Still cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now there's another point, I think, that, it, you know, again, if this is something you don't want to get into because you want to uh, save it for you, just let me know. But uh, there was also another point that skeptics would point out. Do you remember, Do you know which one I'm referring to in the hangar? In the hangar. So they would say, well, how is it possible with the angle that Bob was at that he would have seen the, the flag? No, the no. other. Oh, the other hangars. Yes. Okay. Oh is that, yeah, is that something you want to? Sure. I mean, okay. yeah, that's that's a that's an easy that's actually an easy one, and we built the whole facility. Obviously, we built the entire facility. We yeah, didn't so just that's build something you didn't even touch on. Yeah, yet. right. Yeah, so we didn't just build, you know, the lab and the briefing room and the nurse station. We built the whole facility. Now, what's really important to know is that there 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 is a there is a long corridor inside of the base. Okay. So when you enter the base, there's the hand scanner room, you open these double doors, and now you have this extremely, what, almost co almost like an infinity yeah. hallway, mm -hmm. okay? To the left of it is the propulsion lab, and right after is the main hangar, the first hangar, and then subsequent to that are uh, the other hangars, because mm -hmm. it's a long line, so there's a total of nine hangars. To the right side, there's a little hallway that goes to the nurse station, and then after that, there's the briefing room. There's another office. There's the washroom. There's the there's the cafeteria and and the the, eat, the lunch room and all that. And there's probably more. Bob never went past the lunch room. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he always was very cautious to say everything until this door. He says I've been to. Yeah. He says I've never been past the lunchroom door right so he goes there were doors i could see he says i remember seeing there was doors yeah but i have no idea what was in there so i can't other I, departments i don't know yeah. okay uh, as far as the uh hangers are concerned he only was inside the main hangar the first hangar with the sport model the big one the big one correct now at one time there was also what's really important there was also a door the propulsion, the propulsion lab. If you're you're in this long corridor, the propulsion lab is the first. There's two doors to it, so it's, it's a pretty big lab. So you have two doors that go in, one, and you walk a while, and there's another one mm -hmm. to go into the same propulsion uh, lab. Once you're inside the lab, there's actually a door that leads right straight into the main hangar from huh. the propulsion lab. Okay. Okay. That's something that's really important. So, but. From the corridor, obviously, there's a door yes. to go into the, the, the hangar as well. Now, he was one time, at one time, he and Barry were inside the propulsion lab. Dennis came in there and said, Barry, could you and Bob bring Bob out? There's a, there, we're doing, conducting a test of the craft. This is when he visually saw the craft do like what they, what he called an Omicron test, like a low power test uh -huh. where the craft was in outside. It was, so he, opens they open the door now they're walking into the hangar now from the position where they are they're they're essentially staring at the wall that is adjacent to the other hangar right at that moment 
when he came in, the craft wasn't there. Mm-hmm. The craft was outside. And the adjacent doors, all the adjacent doors were opened mm-hmm. from every single other hangar. So they were all these large metallic doors. Yeah. Each metallic door had its little door as yeah. well. Which, so they didn't always have to open the big thing. They right. actually had a normal sized door if they wanted to. So all of all of the big hangar, adjacent hangar doors were open. And he had for, he 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 says, I remember walking in and there was no wall. So he goes, it caught my attention and it, I could see how incredibly huge the facility was because I could see mm-hmm. really far away. And he goes, now, mind you, this was not a long glance. Like he says, this happened fairly quickly because here we are following Dennis. Yeah. I got Barry next to me. I look, the craft is not in the hangar. So it's a it's a pretty desolate, it's vast. a vast, yeah. you know, door open and I could see that there's a other crafts in in adjacent hangars. So he was able to make out the shape of the first two, the first one. He calls it it calls it the jello mold. Looks like a an old gel metallic jello mold. Basically, that's what it yeah. said it looked like. Look a weird shape. It was a little smaller than the the sport model, but still a, a, a sizable craft. And the hangar after that, he called it the the top hat craft, it, like a like a straw hat or a, a top hat. Yep. It was flat in the middle with with a much flatter rounded area. And he says this craft was propped up on its side like leaning on the wall, like basically leaning on the wall or the adjacent m- m- big door. Right. And it's just leaning there. L- like, like it was weird that it was not yeah. on the ground. And it had a about this size hole into the thinner part edge of it as if like something, like a projectile busted through. Bust, bust, bust through. And he saw that very clearly. Now, he said, and I, 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 I spent so many so much time asking him so many questions about this and he always would look at me and he goes luigi this this was like a a second or two like he goes i, I <laughs> but it matters yeah yeah <laughs> right yeah and i'm trying to get like but you know did you see anything else he's like i couldn't see i could see there were other crafts past it he said you could see little metal things because there was at that angle yeah he could only see the one that was adjacent to the main hangar yeah the one following was propped up so he yeah. was able to see that he After says that the angle just kind of he sh- goes i can't i couldn't make out yeah the uh, you know and what's interesting is that was another thing i wanted to do right i was like i can't wait to see this so we built it obviously and i i asked chris i said can you do me a favor can you open all the adjacent doors, make the lights, you know, turn, open up the hangar door. I want the lighting to be exactly like that. And I want to walk. I want to position myself right here and I want to look and I want to see. And I, I remember I, I go, holy shit. You could clearly see the first, obviously the first one's right there. Yeah. So, you know, it looks like okay, we made it like the craft. I saw the other one, which is, yeah, you know, propped, propped up. up. And then further, we have crafts, which, by the way, uh, are creative liberty designs because he never see he never saw them. Yeah. So he said, "You you Go can nuts. take create yeah <laughs> certainly take creative liberty because we don't wait." Know. So which crafts did you make? I didn't yeah, see these. Yeah, yeah. Are these... We're gonna show you these. Yeah, All right, yeah, yeah. we'll keep these yeah. as a surprise. We, we certainly used. I what I did is I decided to use known sighting crafts amazing so, you know so I that, love it, that you know what i mean Easter eggs. yeah exactly so, so people cool. would have to go oh that's from that one and, you know but and he said what i could see was the color mm. he goes i could see the color but he goes past the fifth one it, i couldn't could see anything, anymore yeah. right is really too far away so i wanted to see how far can i see at that angle. At that angle. And it was exactly like that. I said, you see the, the jello mold, you see the top hat, you could see maybe one or two, just the metallic piece. And then after that, you're just like, I, yeah. it's too Can't far away. It wow. Which, again, you have to wonder, how could he know? And again, always remember, the physics are accurate, the lighting is accurate, the balance, everything is absolutely accurate. So you have to be pretty good at making out those type of details in your mind 
if you're trying to make something up. See, this is this is what I'm talking about here. It's not just this, and I'm sure like this is why people have to understand like where I'm coming from as well, like hanging out with you and hearing these things because it's not one thing. Right. It's not one piece of evidence. Right. And that has been Bob's consistency throughout all of this. Oh yeah. That if you look at all of this, really, really look at it, it's never one thing. No. It's that's never right. it's it's always another thing. And then another thing. And yeah. then another thing. And it yeah. doesn't stop. Stop. Yeah. It doesn't stop being verified at no point are is there like some wild inconsistency. The inconsistencies that people have found are so yeah. nebulous and, and and inaccurate. Some and, of them are inaccurate. And inaccurate, yeah. yeah. Well, I think the most important thing that happened over the two years that we've been working with Bob, that I've been working with Bob, is I got to know Bob. And I didn't get to know Bob, the UFO guy. I got to know Bob Lazar, the person. Mm. And that was kind of something that was unexpected in the way it happened because I did not expect him to be so um, humble and so open to working with us in, in this project. And one of his friends has said to me, when you get to find out how Bob, who Bob really is, you'll understand why, you'll, why Bob is saying the truth. Mm. If he's like this, but then he would be lying about all this, that would be such a clash. Yeah. Never raised a flag. I mean, and we went through sure. in everything yeah. in de and many times over. So I, I am 100% convinced that he did this, that he was there. I, I don't doubt that he was in that craft, that he physically touched and manipulated the components of the craft. I don't doubt that at all. I don't doubt that there were the people that he said that were there because of the way he described them and what they said and how they went about doing things. I don't doubt what happened internally with how they were trying to reverse engineer this. I, the way it was, it, to me, he wasn't told everything. Mm. So it was compartmentalized. Yeah. So that also comes through when he's speaking. Yeah. And you know, people are like, he didn't go to school or he didn't graduate mm. from MIT. There's a there's a real answer to the MIT, by the way. Yeah. I don't know if anybody will ever share that with you. Bob shared that with me. He shared that with Joe Rogan. From what I understood, I can completely understand why he can't say it. Right. So. It's impossible for him to talk about yeah, that. So a lot of a lot of the things that uh, people are skeptical about, um, there's a reason why. There's a there's a reason. Yeah, and sense. all I can say mm -hmm. is, I know this is going to piss off a lot of people, and it's obviously frustrating. But there's a national security element to what Bob was doing back then, yeah. and you cannot fuck with that. Yeah. It it's a problem. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said to me which is disclosable, is he said, why would I put other people's lives in, in problems yeah. just so that I can appease the people who don't believe my story? He says, I would rather they don't believe my story than myself causing a yeah. firestorm because he says, I wasn't the only one on, not, not at S4, yeah. at the MIT mm -hmm. portion of his life. There, was, there were other people there. And he goes, the second I elaborate, I, I'm kind of obligated to open Pandora's box on yeah, that. Yeah, people can go check the other people. And, and, and then it becomes a nightmare. Yeah. So he says, why do I need to do that? I don't need to do that. Yeah. And I fully agreed with him. I would do the exact same thing. Yeah. He says, yeah, sure, I, I could tell you. He says, you just, just don't, don't talk don't about it, it out there, yeah. because it's not something that I should say. He elaborated on that part and that was a big one for me because yeah. i was always stuck on that's that. one of the small things that kept you back always because you know it's like okay yeah. like seriously are they that good at fucking that's erasing right. exactly. you know what i mean like yeah, it, it yeah this, this becomes deep conspiracy it uh, becomes too intense yeah. yeah so and when he went and he detailed it i was like oh fuck like it totally it made, made sense, sense. Uh, and it, it's not even that complicated, but it makes perfect sense. And, it, and I remember going, fuck, it's too bad we can't talk about that because it would just, yeah. 
it would, first of all, there's a lot of naysayers out there. They would, as Mario Santa Cruz likes to say, they would just have to shut the fuck up yeah. after that. Yeah. Because there's a big, here's a slam dunk. Yeah. Now, they, now fucking say something against that. The truth is, that. though, they would find something else. Oh, they would. Yes, there's no yeah, doubt. Yeah. There's no question. I personally believe that he's omitting mm -hmm. and not lying. Yeah. I think, there, I think there's enough stuff that he's omitting that is very pertinent to this type of operation. If he's deceiving the world with all this, yeah. he must be the best there is yeah. because there's just no way that I believe this guy is, is lying. I'm so happy that you know we got to meet and that Same. you let me you know, Same, come yeah. in and be a part of this a little bit yeah. in uh, any way that I can. Um, it means the world to me. And, and to us too, by the way. Thank yeah. you. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm super proud of you and I'm, I'm super proud of your team for what you've achieved so far. This is going to be a great, great project. Um, I know it is. I'm, I'm rooting for you. I'm excited for you. I'm excited for you guys to see, you know, what this is. And I'm, I'm sure you are too, to finally get it Crazy. off, your, off yeah. your plate and yeah. be like, enjoy world. Yeah. Oh yeah. I can't wait for the people to see this. I hope people like it. Obviously there's always that worry that we always like, I hope people like this. You know, mm. it's, it's normal as much as we look at the shots and we're like, wow. We just want to make sure, you know, it's, and again, we're always being true to form. It's, it's exactly what he saw. Yeah. So we're not embellishing. It's, it's, we, we, we hope people like it, you know, and I, and I thank you also for supporting us and helping us, of course. And, you know, cause it's, it's great. It's yeah. one thing I did want to uh, cover, which, you know, well, oh, yeah. So here folks, we have. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you acquired these. Yeah, so this is a really interesting little Ziploc bag with some uh -huh. really cool pictures. So <laughs> I, I remember we were doing some history stuff, and, and we needed some really good pictures of when Bob was really young. So I, I called up uh, Bob and Joy, his wife, and I said, you know, I, I think we're going to need some pictures because we can't seem to find anything of when you were you really young boy. So Joy says, don't worry, I'll get you some really cool pictures. So she put together a whole bunch of like cool, cool, real original pictures. One of them is Bob when he was probably like th two or three years old, and, <laughs> you know, and, and there's him at, at when he would have fit in one of those little yeah, chairs. Yeah. On craft, <laughs> he would have fit, yeah, that was the time he could have fit in them. Right. Yeah. And uh, him at Desert Blast and him at Capcom. One of his friends was in uh, charge at NASA's Mission Control. Mm -hmm. There's a picture of that in there. Uh, there's also uh, him with uh, John Lear. There's even a picture of him with George Carlin in yeah. there when he, when he met George Carlin. Yeah. Is he is he a big comedy yeah, fan? Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a comedy. He's a fan of George Carlin, and George Carlin was a huge fan of Bob Lazar. George Carlin was into UFOs. Yeah, yeah, he oh, was. I love that. Yeah, so that was cool. That you know? is super so, cool. And there's like some friends and family and you know and it was just so cool to Dude, see these that looks like ah, a, you know this looks ass. like straight up like a mad max you know i have a story he told me a story about that he, he that that jet car he actually said that the first second or the first couple of seconds he would pass out from the g from yeah so he says he would wake up <laughs> at top speed bob's a bit of a badass oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, can you imagine waking up at top speed? That's John, John Lear reading a Playboy upside yeah, down. Upside down, yeah, yeah. That's that's the way to do it on a photo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not how I consume Playboy. Right, yeah. Bob Blasting. is meant for speed. Oh yeah, like that's what he loves, man. That's Bob was a uh, the true Bob Lazar that I got to know over the years is a a man who has a a, a true passion for high energy whether mm -hmm. that be thrusters for speed or for explosives something right. that really makes a, ha a hell of a boom this is right? so, oh my god this car is so cool that's the that's the honda jet car that's, that's the famous honda this jet is car. the reason he that, ended up in a ufo that's right yeah that was featured in the article yeah that's yeah. right that's the car and wow. we actually we, we actually have plans to, after all this is done, mm -hmm. and that we 
we spend some time recreating that in 3D because I want to actually make it into a diecast model. Yeah, because cool. I mean, it's still something that is historic. It's because yeah. of this car that, that, that he, got, he hired. got hired. Yeah, yeah so it was I the mean, article. So that's right. For for those that don't know, uh, Bob uh, he was featured in an article in the Los Alamos in Los uh, Al yeah in the Los yeah. Alamos newspaper, local the, newspaper. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and uh, it's like, hey, a scientist makes you know jetpack car or whatever it was. Uh, yeah, Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, was there giving us a speech, reading the paper, and Bob goes wanted to meet him. He goes, that's me on the front page. Yeah. So Teller goes, that's pretty cool. Talked about his last name. And then he remembered him years later. He set when, up a meeting. And then he says, go to EG&G Special Projects, and that's how he got uh, interviewed. That was a friend of his uh, that had created that alien. Oh, I thought you said that was a friend of his. No, like, no, oh, no, that, that created that like, <laughs> thing there. I guess this is always Desert Blast, yeah, wow, all so these cool. things. Yeah, him in a helicopter at Desert Blast. They. I mean, they ran Desert Plast, I think, for almost like 10 years, 10, 10 or 12 years. And that was Bob's thing. Oh, yeah, that was Bob. That was 100% Bob's thing. This gathering represents every bomb demolition team's nightmare. Once a year, a group of pyro enthusiasts sneak out into the Nevada desert, far from the reach of the law, and go crazy. Welcome to Desert Blast. And it started off with a little private. It was it was small at the beginning, and it en it ended up being a, a pretty big event where thousands of people would come in. People would fly in with their planes, helicopters, and it's interesting because that's the true Bob. Yeah, doing that, and they would do this at Dry Lake, outside of Las Vegas, in the middle of the desert in Nevada. And when we shot with the DeLorean time machine for the movie. Yeah. You know, there's there's a scene. Yep. You'll see that. We went out there. Uh, Bob came out. Well, we went out, all of us, my whole team, uh, production, the whole production team, the cam all the our equipment. We rented an RV. We had the DeLorean time machine brought out there. We had <laughs> the a wild thing yeah, to say. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, the, from Back to the Future. Like, oh, we had the time machine. Yeah, right. We had the guy who owned the car out there. We had uh, a Jeep and a four, a four, four by four tons of equipment we brought explosives out there and and we spent two days filming in the middle of the desert with bob lazar Dude. and to this day bob says i i i'll let him say it i i will say it's probably some of the best memories of my life mm. this is an actual piece of one of the bombs that we blew up oh, nice. blew up up there and this was sent to me by Chris Sanford, the owner of the DeLorean in Las Vegas. And he, th th this this piece here on the car, he had to replace it, and it's this. Wow. So he goes, I was gonna throw it in the trash, but he goes, why don't I just send that to you so that you do something with so it? So cool. So that was part of the the, the original car that I, I'm, I don't know what I'm gonna do with, but I'm gonna do something with that. We've got, we just got back from, from Vegas, and I had everybody sign it. Oh, cool. So I have like George Knapp, Bob George, Jeremy, I think that's Jeremy, and then there's uh, Gene Huff, myself, there's Chris, that's Chris, my Chris here. And that was like on, in November in Las Very Vegas, cool. everybody signed it. And I thought, you know, why not? Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the, it's the warning sign. It was your little uh, Area 51 shrine. Yeah, exactly. Nice. We went out there, it was cool. We even got some dirt from Area 51. This is literally, we got it shipped. <laughs> the fun we had it's was beautiful. insane. Like kids. Yeah, like kids. It was like every, and Mario Santa Cruz came out there Mario's a longtime friend of Bob Lazar who used to go to that. He was at the first Desert Blast. Mario was out there and started getting teary eyed because he oh. said, This is exactly what we used to have back then. Yeah. He's like, I can't believe you were able to make us live this again. And Bob was like, Out. I remember he was further out just on his own doing something. And his wife came up to me. Joy came up to me. She goes, Look at my honey. She goes, he's home. Hmm. And and Bob was like lit up. He missed being out there. Yeah. Yeah. That's his um his true calling is propulsion. Oh is, yeah. Is anything that oh, blows up. Absolutely. So you've got pyrotechnicians competing against each other to see who can impress <laughs> you know everybody. So it's uh, quite a collection of everything. 
12 years ago, physicist Bob Lazar decided that he wanted to blow things up without getting arrested for it. We actually talked about, he, he's, he's talked about um, possibly doing a on invitation only one desert blast event. Oh, that would be amazing. Yeah, there. So if ever that happens, yeah. I'll let you know. Because <laughs> that'll be it. one be there. hell of an experience. Oh, my yeah. God. I can't even imagine. Getting an invitation to Desert Blast is a really difficult thing, and we, we purposely make it that way. We're very selective on who we allow to come, and, and by doing that, we really weed out all of the bad, you know, any of the bad influence you might see at any party of this size. Blink your eyes, we're here and gone, and you know, that's it. It's so nice to see these pictures because I think this, and you know, you're showing a side of Bob in this movie that people aren't used to seeing. Now, right. we had a bit of a conversation before this about how parasocial relationships work. You know, I've you know, uh, my, I've had my fair share of, you know, uh, fandom and, and people, uh, you know, the love, the hate, the, all the things. All that, yeah. And, you know, people often forget that the, the people you watch on these videos and stuff like that, they're people. And I know that sounds cliche, uh, but they're just they're just somebody just like you, just like me. They're just somebody. They That's weren't right. born into any of this. Yeah. They're, they're just a person. And, you know, we often forget that when we either idolize someone or we categorize someone or, you know, some platform makes yeah. someone into yeah. like this avatar that they aren't. And then you see pictures like this, which aren't digital. They aren't touched up. They aren't Photoshop. They're moments. That's right. Of, of giant smiles and, you know, and just conversation and real moments of life. And, you, and it, it's really refreshing to see, I think, that. And I can't wait for people to experience that in this movie. I think that is a really yeah. important thing. And, and it speaks to his character and his credibility. I think, uh, you know, that's, again, something you forget when you you know, when you look at the story of Travis Walton or right. you look at John Lear or you look at uh, even uh, Grush, you know, or all these, you know, whistleblowers and stuff. We we tend to just categorize them based on their body of work right. or what we're familiar with. Right. But you forget that they have friends, families, problems. Lives, normal life. Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I'm really uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that side of things. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, spending oh, you time will. with Bob. Yeah. That, that you had those moments with him and you know that's that's really cool and that must have meant a lot for him too to invite you mm. you know i can't imagine how guarded bob is in 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 real life about letting people in i i i got to say you know i started off with wanting to do a project with bob lazar and i'm at a point where i could i can openly say i've become friends i become i've become his friend yeah. and we've become friends and our conversations are no more, they no longer talk about flying saucers. We no longer talk about the project or flying saucers or the government or mm -hmm. whatever is going on. Our conversations are, how's life? What, what's up? What's going on? Yeah. You know, wh what was happening in the barn yesterday? And he'll ask me how my family's doing or, yeah. you know, what's what's new? And, hey, did you change your car? There was a problem with like it. it, it it's it's different when you get to know the person. He's a very he's a very down to earth person. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we all noticed, and this is my sister, my wonderful little niece, Luna, who's the love of my life, who's <laughs> six years old, he asks about them. And he, he also, I mean, this is something that was interesting. One time I was Zooming with him and Luna came, you know, next to me because she was at my house and she's just like, hi, Bob. And he was so kind and wanting to talk with her and take time to talk to her. And I mean, she has no idea who she's talking yeah, to. She's talking to Bob. For her, it's, it's Bob. You know, yeah. she met him and she's just a nice guy. You know, I told her, I said, you know, Bob worked on a spaceship one time. And she's like, a real one? You know, I said, yeah. She's like, oh, that's cool. And then goes on yeah. to, you know, it's awesome. Yeah. Magic exists for her already. A, so it, it was, it's great to have built that relationship with him. I got to have an amazing relationship also with, with him, his wife. I mean, such wonderful people. They they care about animals. And also something that is going to be shown is how much they care about animals. Mm. I mean, it's it's a freaking it's it's insane when you go to their place. They got 
tons of dogs, cats, horses. They have a bird area where there's like thousands of birds and bird feeders. There's it's absolutely it's like a hair like literally you know, remember in, in Ace Ventura when he goes, oh, you know, all the animals are, you remember that? You know, yeah. that's how I felt one time when I was there. I was like, oh my God, it's like all the animals are here, you know, yeah. and they care for them and they're worried, you know, they got to go feed them. And I, I, I was shoveling horseshit with Bob in the barn. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's cool to, that's so cool, dude, to see that. Yep. You know, I think it's important to see that, yeah. you know, for, for this, because it, it really shows the other side of the coin. Yeah. Like he's got his own things going on. So it's it, humanizing, I think, is very important, not only in this story, I think in general. I think we all need to normalize the fact that, like, yeah. we, sh- we shouldn't idolize anyone. Right. That's um, that, that's important. You know, we yeah. got flaws, we got ups, we got downs, but it's really cool that you were able to uh, do that in a way that adds to the story and that, you know, that becomes like an integral, I think, part of the story and part of his character and part of why it's so interesting to see a guy who's just a guy. That's right. Work at the most extraordinary place in the world. Yeah. And he did. Incredible. Incredible. I'm so stoked <laughs> for this, man. It's cool. Dude, this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be so cool. Guys, you are in for a treat when this comes out. I'm telling you right now, um you know, we'll obviously keep you guys up to date on what happens. And as soon as Luigi's allowed to talk about anything further, uh, you know, check out that channel and then we'll relay the information here. We're going to scream it at the top of our lungs. Looking forward to this. Luigi, thanks again, man. Thank you, man. Brother, love you, man. Always a pleasure. Same yeah. here. If you guys want to, first of all, support uh, Luigi, Project Gravitor, S4, the Bob Lazar story, the experience, the future book. All of that stuff, you can go to projectgravitor.com. You can also visit uh, Project Gravitor at Instagram. I'll leave the link below to that. Uh, be sure to keep your eyes peeled on their YouTube as well, which they'll be you know, promoting, posting behind the scenes. And there's a lot of other behind the scenes projects to come. Uh, so you guys will be satiated. You will have your fill of this you know, sure. entire uh, piece of history. So stay tuned for that. Uh, leave a like, subscribe, leave us a five-star review on Spotify and iTunes, whatever platform you're using. Join us on the Discord. It is free. We have tons of Q&As there that you guys can participate in. Maybe have you on a Q&A as sure. well. That'd be fun. You guys can ask your questions directly to Luigi. And if you want to support this channel directly, head over to Patreon, $5 a month, half the price of a cup of Starbucks coffee, <laughs> which you drink every day. It helps us uh, get out there, buy plane tickets and hotels and fly guests in and all these things. Uh, you know, we really do appreciate your help and we can use your help, uh, you know, in, in maintaining this level of quality for these investigations. So appreciate you guys. And we'll see you there. Thanks for watching. Is, exactly. that, is that like the goal here is to, is to really get people to feel like they are yeah. Bob yeah. or like to feel like they're just going to S4? Is it? We're, are kind we are we following Bob's footsteps or are we taking a tour for ourselves? Like what's so, the... it's a it's a little bit of both. Little I would both. say yeah. for the VR experience, it really is like you are Bob, right? Yeah. You are Bob. And right. What he saw, how he saw it. What's yeah. the what's a average day and what's like a more yeah kind of you can call it that yeah. experimental yeah <laughs> sure, to him yeah. right yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then for the film, it's really about closure. Ah. It's here's the story in all of its form. It's like the the it's the Bible. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, really, everything. it's everything. It's Beautiful. everything yeah. condensed into a feature-length film there. So, so exciting. 